Hi, welcome to Amazing Discoveries Sabbath School. This quarter we are studying the book of Daniel and today we will continue our study by studying Daniel chapter 1. I'm actually really excited about it. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this time and this privilege that we get to be together to open the Bible and to study. Uh, Father, we on our own cannot do that. We need your help. Lord, I do not have the skills to expound the words of truth. And I pray and I ask, Lord, for your spirit to be with me and give me the words and the thoughts, the understanding and the wisdom. And I pray that you give our listeners also the hearing and the heart to accept the truth. And I pray, Father, that as we study together, we will not only be blessed, but converted and convicted of your truth. And I thank you and I pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, and our righteousness. Amen. Before we dive into uh, Daniel chapter 1, I think it is only appropriate for us to review a little bit some of the things we've talked about last week. Uh, one of the things that we looked at was Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, where Jesus himself um, speaks of Daniel. And we learned that according to Jesus, Daniel was a real historical figure who wrote the book of Daniel. He was a prophet. Jesus acknowledges his prophetical writing because he quotes from it. And not only that, his writing, according to Jesus, should be carefully studied and understood. Jesus says that we can understand the book of Daniel. And more importantly, it is relevant, especially for us who live in the end time. The other thing that we looked at is we looked at the term apocalypticism. apocalypticism. Um, we discovered that biblical apocalypticism is not the same thing as simply apocalypticism or apocalyptic genre. It's different. It is prophetical. It is not just a literary style. The other thing that we look is we look at some of the components of Daniel. We found out that is, there is historical data, there's biographical information and there's prophetical portions that are all useful for us today and so we need to pay attention to them and finally we took a look at uh, interpretation and so we looked at uh, preterism and futurism and we discovered that uh, both of these methods are not valid because their only goal was to um, discredit what the reformers had come to conclude through the prophecies. And so we discovered that they were unreliable because they did not take into account the historical context. Uh, we also looked at idealism and we also discovered that idealism was not um, proper for us because again, it divorces from the historical context and makes everything pretty much whatever you want it to mean. Finally, we discover that we need to build on what the godly men of the past have discovered. And so historicism is what we use as a method of interpretation. It is um, for us to realize that it is grounded in reality and in history. We also looked at a man called Porphyry, and we also found out that um, he tried to discredit, uh, discredit Christianity by placing the writing of the book of Daniel in the second century BC rather than the sixth century BC. And the reason he did that is because he hated Christianity and he wanted to discredit Christ because there are so much prophecies in Daniel that points to Jesus. And so we also reject his interpretation, but we'll be talking a little bit more about him in the future. Today, our lesson is entitled From Jerusalem to Babylon, and we're looking at Daniel chapter 1. Like I said last time we met, Daniel chapter 1 is so important. If we do not understand or study Daniel chapter 1, it is nearly impossible for us to understand the rest of Daniel. The events in the chapters are so crucial, so crucial, that um, if, if they would have taken place in any other way, if things would have been any different, we probably would not even have the book of Daniel today. So let's go right away to our Bible and let's open to the book of Daniel. And we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter one and we're gonna look at our memory text 
And our memory text today is found in verse 17 of chapter 1. It reads, As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, the memory text this week is, is quite important. What it does is that it emphasizes the fact that what Daniel, Ananiah, Michelle, and Azariah possessed in intellectual vigor and prowess was given to them by God. In fact, everything we have really comes from God. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So all the good gifts, which would mean knowledge, skills in all learning and wisdom, understanding and visions and dreams, comes from God. Now the second point that I, I want to take some time to spend on, because these points, this principle that we're going to study, is seen through the book of Daniel chapter 1, and it gives us the key to understand the rest of Daniel. Child Guidance, page 352, paragraph 1, tells us, Teach your children to reason from cause to effect. Show them that if they violate the laws of their being, they must pay the penalty in suffering. If you cannot see as rapid improvement as you desire, do not be discouraged, but instruct them patiently and press on until victory is gained. Think of Daniel and his friend. When they were brought to Babylon, their parents may have never seen the result of their training. But while they were in Babylon, that training paid off. The principle is this, we need to reason from cause to effect. Every effect comes from a cause. And it is an important principle for us to, to think about, not just this morning as we're studying, but every day as we live. Every action has a consequence. Every cause brings an effect. Everything that I do does something. Every word that I speak brings about a result. I, um, I work a lot with, with young people, and, and I'm not picking on young people because uh, some adults don't even have that skill, but <laughs> some young people are developing that skills, and they're, they're trying to reason, and, and I've seen a, a lot of young people that if they would just think a little bit deeper, there's a lot of things they wouldn't do. Relationship they wouldn't engage in. Friendship that they wouldn't continue. Uh, activities that they would shun. And so they're, they're learning to develop that, but the problem is that emotion takes the ascendancy rather than the reason. But that is also true of adult. And uh, if we be honest with, uh, with ourselves, if we be honest with ourselves, uh, there's a lot of things we wouldn't do if we would just reason from cause to effect. Now, granted, sometimes we need to think fast, we need to reason fast, and we need to act fast. But if we would only cultivate this principle of reasoning from cause to effect, we would actually be able to reason from cause to effect fast. What we are lacking is cultivation. What we are lacking is improving that skill. And as we improve that skill, we will make very different choices. Now, as we start with the book of Daniel, a good practice is to break the book down in little sections. It makes it easier to study, and everybody can do that differently. But this is how I like to break down Daniel 1. So Daniel chapter 1, I see verses 1 and 2 as a prologue. And in that prologue, we see a lot of historical data. And then we look at verses 3 to 7, 
where here there is what I would call either a challenge or a trial that is posed. And then in the following verses 8 through 16, right here, we have a plan as well as its execution to meet the trial and the challenge. And finally, in verse 17, we have the result, which we already talked a little bit about, the result of that plan that was meeting the challenge. And then in verses 18 to 21, what I see is an epilogue where again we have some historical data. Speaking of the last few verses of the book, let's go to the last verse in verse uh, 21. And what we will read here is, And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Now, this is actually really interesting. Because if you think about it, <clears throat> for Daniel to know that he would reign, that he would not reign, but that rather that he would um, be serving until the first thing of King Cyrus, he would have had to be there. Therefore, that tells us that the book of Daniel was actually written in retrospect. After the fact, he went back almost 70 years later, recounting his history and the beginning of his uh, story in Babylon. So now let's go to Daniel chapter 1 and let's start our study. Verse 1, we read, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. So a little bit of historical background. If you would like, you can go to the book of 2 Kings chapter 23, and there we find the history of Jehoiakim. And I'm just going to summarize just for the sake of time. Uh, basically, Pharaoh Necho uh, came to Jerusalem and conquered. And he took, um, what was his name, Jehoahaz, which was the, the king at the time, removed him, brought him to, Jeru to Egypt, where he eventually died. He took Iliakim, changed his name to Jehoiakim, and made him his servant, and he served him for 12 years. Question, was Jehoiakim a good king or a bad king? Well, according to verse 37, it says that he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. So he was not a good king. Now, in the following chapter, in chapter 24 of 2 King, we read that now Nebuchadnezzar came, and he remove, well, no, he did not immediately, he took over and he allowed Jehoiakim to serve him. But three years later, Jehoiakim rebelled. And this is when uh, Nebuchadnezzar came back and disposed of him. And so back to chapter two, uh, to chapter one of Daniel and verse two, we read, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand with and to his hand, the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now we're going to talk more about these vessels when we uh, come in the later chapters, but these vessels were very important. They were uh, used in the service of the temple of God. And so in effect, what they were doing is they were taking these vessels from the temple of God, they were bringing it to the temple of the Babylonian God, and they were saying, our God is stronger than your God because we gained the victory and you're the losers. Of course, at this time, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar doesn't know that it was actually God who gave him the victory as we've just read, but eventually he will. Now, the historical record tells us that um, Nabopolazar, which was the father of Nebuchadnezzar, actually sent him to quench a rebellion in Egypt. And on his way there, he went through Jerusalem, and that's why this uh, event happened. And then while he was there, he heard that his father, Nabopolazar, died. And so he had to rush back to uh, Babylon uh, to make sure that nobody would usurp the throne. And that brings us to verse 3 and 4. It says, And the king spake unto Hashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed 
and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, well favor, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. While Nebuchadnezzar left, he placed his master of eunuchs in charge. And what he did, what they wanted to do, is they wanted to bring some of the captives and bring them to Babylon. Now, before we say why, let's look at the requirements. They had to be children. Now, the word children doesn't mean little kids, okay? It means youth and young adults. They were to be king's seeds, so princes. They had to have no blemish. I mean, no scars, no physical disabilities. Well-favored, meaning physically attractive. Skillful in all wisdom. Cunning in knowledge. And they had to understand science, which means to mentally separate and be able to understand things. So they were looking for academically proficient young people. The purpose was to train them to become Babylonian. So they would be Jews, but their way of thinking, their way of acting would be Babylonian. So that if ever they needed to send someone back to Judah, to Jerusalem, to Israel to rule, they could take this person who knew that although they were Jewish in heritage, they would be faithful to Babylon. So now they would need to do some reconditioning. And that process took three steps. The first one we already read here is what they wanted to do was to change their education. First step, education. We read just now that it says that they might teach the learning and the tongues of the Chaldean. They would send them to the best Babylonian university, the Ivy League, to train them. There's two things to take away from this. First of all, we need to understand that although there was a lot of superstition in the religious uh, ground, the religious circle of Babylon, there was also a lot of knowledge, academic and intellectual. There was a lot of scholars. They were very good in mathematics, astrology, I mean astronomy, not astrology, but well, they probably had astrology. Astronomy and uh, mathematics, uh, science, all these different things were, they were very highly educated people. The other point to keep in mind is the deep impact that education has on young people. That cannot be more stressed. I've seen many young people enter higher education on fire for God, and they came out atheists. That is a sombering thought. Not because the religion of Christ is, is unintellectual or stupid or uh, that cannot be defended, simply because our young people are neglected in their spiritual education. They don't know what they believe, they don't know why they believe it, and they don't know how to defend it. Take a moment, I'd like to talk to the parents out there. Let me be very honest with you. No matter how good, and I said that to my church, okay, in front during a sermon, so I have no problem telling you that. There is, no matter how good your church is, no matter how good your Sabbath school teachers are, no matter how good the school that your child is going to, do not depend on these institutions for the salvation of your child. It is way too important. You cannot let your child's eternal life in somebody else's hand. You need to take ownership of that. When I uh, went back to university, uh, few years back, I completed my degree in biblical study, and it was my first week there. I, <clears throat> for some reason, my, my schedule was a little weird, and I actually had upper class, upper level classes. And I was sitting in one of those class, and uh, the teacher was doing his usual introduction, asking everybody where they came from, and what was their plan, their goal. And I was sitting with different students from different programs. Some of them were studying to become pastors. One of those young men said, and I, I expected that, but I didn't expect to hear it. He said, I came here, and this is a Christian university. 
I came here because I wanted to become a pastor, but since I've been here, I've lost my faith. And now I'm not sure what I'm going to do. I think I'm probably going to finish my program and I might still become a pastor. And I was like, wow, I cannot believe that this is happening. And it, it, it reminded me how strong I must be in my faith if I want to get through. By the time I completed my degree, I was sitting in class and I remember thinking, I was looking around me and I was seeing all these young people uh, many of them, again, would be graduating to become pastor. And I was thinking, with all the classes that I've, ta I, I've taken, with all the education that I have now, there is no way, and I had pastor for a few years, there is no way that these kids are ready to pastor a church. It would be more merciful to, and, and I don't want to sound mean, but it would be more merciful to throw them in front of a bus. It was... I'm telling you this bad. For, for young people to lose their faith, it's pretty intense. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I want you to understand that you cannot depend on the, educa the educational system to train your child for eternity. You must take ownership. You must train your child yourself. And for those that are older, older youth, and young adult, it is your responsibility to open the scripture and find out for yourself why you believe what you believe and how to defend it. Don't depend on your teachers, on your pastors. Depend on God. And aside from all that, you got to also think on those campuses, all the temptation that comes. So if you don't have a strong faith and you don't realize that you're going to face so many temptations, I'm talking things like, you know, parties, alcohol, drugs, sex, violence, uh, on and on, peer pressure to make you do things that you would not normally do. Daniel and his friends probably faced the same thing. It would not have been any different. And on top of that, the school that they were going to was not to help them in their faith. It was actually to destroy their faith, to indoctrinate them in a different system of belief they had to be strong. Close this. That's for education. The next thing that they wanted to do is in verse 5. It says, And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now this might seem like irrelevant, the fact that they wanted to change their diet and feed them. But it actually has a very, very profound impact. But I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Now let's go to verse 6. Where we now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Have you noticed what it said? It said, among these. That means that Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were not the only ones there. Keep that in mind. We go on reading, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Ananiah of Shadrach, to Mishael of Meshach, to Azariah of Abednego. This was a direct attempt or even a direct attack on their identity. Each of these young men's name had a very specific meaning. Parents took the time to give them these names, either to um, remind them of who they were or of whom they would like them to be. Now, let's look at the meaning of these names. Daniel, we've talked last time, means God is my judge. Ananiah means Jehovah is gracious. Mishael probably means who belongs to God. And finally, Azariah means Jehovah helps. Now the new name, see, for, before the new name, these names always talked about their God, always talked about their faith, always talked about their belief. It was a constant reminder of the God whom they served. But now the new names had very different meaning. Belteshazzar, which was a new name for Daniel, means Prince of Bel, or may Bel 
uh, protect him, protect the king. Shadrach means servant of sin, sin being uh, a name for the moon god. Meshach means who is what Aku is, and Aku is a Sumerian god of the moon. And then finally, Abednego means servant of Nebo. From now on, their name would no longer remind them of their god, but it would remind them of the gods of Babylon. And so every time they would hear that, they would be um, indoctrinated, always remembering we are serving a different God, or at least that was the idea. Prophets and Kings tells us, the king did not compel the Hebrew youth to renounce their faith in favor of idolatry, but he hoped to bring this about gradually. By giving them names significant of idolatry, by bringing them daily into close association with idolatrous customs and under the influence of the seductive rites of heathen worship, he hoped to induce them to renounce the religion of their nation and to unite with the worship of the Babylonians. Today, our youths everywhere are constantly being bombarded through so many media as to whom they should be. What are you looking at? Advertisement, Hollywood, the music industry, social media, everyone has an opinion as to whom they should be. Throw in some social justice and sexual reform and the confusion is huge. Foundation of the family is eroding, which means that strong role models are dying out. By the time they reach adolescence, and, and by the way, if you, if you look at how the word adolescence came about or this category, it's very sad. It's very, very sad. Young people in their teenage year are at a crossroad to whom um, they will become, and everyone has a say. Everyone has a voice. Young friends, if you want to know who you should be, don't listen to any of them. Go find out from God. Go and see and understand the life of Jesus. You can't go wrong by being like Jesus. Identity. This is what they wanted to change through their names. And the one that I didn't talk about just yet is diet. These are the three things that the Babylonian wanted to change to indoctrinate those young Jewish boys. Now, of these three, you would look and you say, well, diet is probably the least important. It's probably the one that's is that really such a big deal? But you know what? Daniel and his friend could handle a change of name. Daniel and his friend could handle a change of education. But when it came to diet, they had a problem. That they could not accept. Now they took issue. Now that was a big deal. And the Babylonians are, are not foolish. Remember, they're, they're highly educated. They knew that to transform them into Babylonian, they have to change their whole lifestyle, which included their diet. On top of that, the food that they were given was the food of the king, what Nebuchadnezzar himself was eating on a daily basis. That would have been like the top food in the whole kingdom. It's almost a privilege. And yet, they had a problem with that. And some of the issues might be things um, that we find uh, mentioned that could have been unclean meats. Beasts that would have probably not been slaughtered uh, according to the Levitical laws. What the Babylonians would do is they would strangle the animals, which means that the blood would remain in the, uh, in, in the muscles, in the, in the meat. And by the way, blood is what gives taste to the meat. If you remove the blood, it's pretty bland. Um, the, the animals would have been pre-offered to idols. Um, luxurious food and unhealthy food and drink is usually, not usually, is contrary to temperance. 
that would have been a problem for Daniel. And finally, Daniel and his friend, they, they wanted to avoid flesh food completely. And we're going to see that in a moment. In the book Ministry of Healing, page 323, we read, carefully consider your diet. Study from cause to effect. Cultivate self-control. Keep appetite under the control of reason. Never abuse the stomach by overeating, but do not deprive yourself of the wholesome, palatable food that health demands. Clearly, Daniel considered the choice, his choice of nutrition. He thought about it. He reasoned from cause to effect. And what he discovered is what we found in verse 8. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. According to Daniel, after reasoning from cause to effect, he said, if I eat this food, if I drink this drink, I will defile myself. What would you have done in this position? Would you, uh, it's just food. How important could that really be? Plus, I would lose all advantages, all advantages that, that is now offered to me just for food. If I submit now, then later I can change. In fact, if I submit now and I get into the close circle of the king, then I can make changes, help the king change. In the youth instructor, we read, among professed Christians today, there are many who would decide that Daniel was too particular and would pronounce him narrow and bigoted. They regard the matter of eating and drinking as of too little consequence to require such a decided choice, one involving the probable sacrifice of every earthly advantage. But in the day of judgment, those who reason thus will find that they turn from God's express requirements and set up their own opinion as a standard of right and wrong. They will find that what seemed to them unimportant was not so regarded by God. His requirements should be sacredly obeyed. Those who accept and obey one of his precepts because it is convenient to do so while they reject another because its observance would require a sacrifice lower the standard of right and by their example lead others to regard lightly his holy law. A thus said the Lord is to be our rule in all things. It's so hard. It's so hard to change the way I eat. But you know, if your faith requires no sacrifice, then why did Jesus sacrifice all? Daniel would prefer to lose all and stay faithful to God. Lose everything but honor God. And friends, this is where you and I have to come to. We have to come to that place that we're willing to, to lose everything but stay faithful to God, even our lives. Verse 9, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who had appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Daniel at this point could have been tempted. He could have said, well, nobody else is doing it. All the other children are not doing it. He could have said, I tried. They said no. Well, I guess it was not meant to be after all. 
But that's not what Daniel did. He, in verse 11, we read, Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs has set over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So Daniel went to somebody else. We went to the one that was on, you know, directly looking after them. And he told him, he told him, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. You know, Daniel could have, could have been rebellious. He could have been vile. He could have gotten angry. He could have been violent. After all, after all, he was a captive. And he could have hated his captor. But that was not his attitude. He was Christ-like at all times. And his captors noticed. They realized that. That's why God was able to bring him into tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And on top of that, Daniel was not being insensitive. He understood the position of the prince of the eunuchs and of Melzar. So instead of either you do it or you don't do it, Daniel looked for a way that he could be sensitive to the position of Melzar as well as not compromise his own position. We should always try to look for a third option that we can work with the other person without compromising. He told them, 10 days, give me 10 days. That's all I need. In 10 days, you can make your decision. You know, at this point, they would have walked from a long time from Jerusalem to Babylon. They would have been exhausted, emaciated, undernourished. But Daniel knew that by following the diet of God, that would be enough to separate him clearly from the rest of the people that would not follow that diet. We read in verse 15, And at the end of ten days, their countenances appear fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Ten days was enough to, to make them, to, to, to increase the contrast between them and the rest of the people. Fairer and fatter in flesh mean that they looked better. They were stronger physically. Now, here is something that is worth revisiting. What happened to the other Jewish boys that were taken with them? Where are they? We only hear about Daniel and his friends. You never hear about them. You, you, you don't know what have become of them. All we can assume is the choice that they make was to not fuss, but to compromise. Was to not stand, but to go along with the flow. They decided to seize all advantages in their slavery to ascend into this world, or into rather the world of Babylon. And you never hear from them. You don't even know who they are. No name. Verse 17, as for these four children, now, these four children, Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, Azariah, we know their name. They're recorded because they stood for God. We read, and as for these four children, God gave them knowledge, skills in all learning, and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams while the others sacrificed their faithfulness to God. These four stood firm, did what was necessary. They didn't care about securing any earthly advantages. They only care about God's honor. And what did they get? They got everything that they needed. In Proverbs chapter 2, 
Beginning in verse 6, we read, For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgment and preserveth the way of, the, of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. Remember the principle we spoke of in the beginning? Cause to effect. The reason, or rather the, 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 the cause why, they, why God was able to give them knowledge and wisdom and skill in all learning is because they remain faithful. I mean, isn't that what every single student would like to have? Knowledge, wisdom, skill in learning. If you're a student out there, a young person, Listen to the scripture. Do not compromise. Do not compromise God for your studies. Do not compromise your devotions to study more. Do not compromise the Sabbath hours to prepare for your exam. Do not compromise your, your well-being by consuming some stimulants so you can study longer into the night. Don't do that. Be faithful to God. Let him give you what you need, the knowledge, the wisdom, and the skill in learning, in learning. Let God do that for you. Listen, you can get a passing grade, you can even get an A plus without God. But how much compromise will that take? Because you can do it with God. You can do it with God. You can get an A+, plus. you can get passing grade, and you can also get to not compromise. You can keep your faith strong. Put your trust in him. Daniel did. And you know that Daniel is proof that you can be faithful and successful at the same time. Daniel is proof of that. In the youth instructor... We read, The Lord will cooperate with all who earnestly strive to be faithful in his service, as ye cooperated with Daniel and his three companions. Fine mental qualities and a high tone of moral character are not the result of accident. God gives opportunities. Success depends upon the use made of them. The opening of providences must be quickly discerned and eagerly enter. There are many who might become mighty men, if, like Daniel, they would depend upon God for grace to be overcomers and for strength and efficiency to do their work. God will never do for us what we can do ourselves. Daniel and his friend didn't just go in a corner, pray, and waited for everything to happen. No, they did everything that they could. They, they put all of their mental abilities to their study. They've made all the sacrifices necessary that they could. They did all the righteous, the, the right choices. They worked hard, honestly, faithfully. They increased every faculties that they had. Then God was able to bless them. Then God knew that it was safe to bestow upon them those amazing gifts. It continues, I address you, young men. Young woman, be faithful, put heart into your work, imitate none who are slothful and who give divided service. Actions often repeated form habits, habits form character. Patiently perform the little duties of life. So long as you undervalue the importance of faithfulness in the little duties, your character building will be unsatisfactory. In the sight of omnipotence, every duty is important. The Lord has said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. In the life of a true Christian, there are no non-essentials. Everything is important. Now let's finish the chapter. Verse 18. 
Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was found none like Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. Where did their wisdom and understanding come from? God. Now remember, these magicians and astrologers were not just um, people who believe in superstition, they were scholars. Mathematics, science, astronomy, they were skillful, they were intelligent, they knew all these things. They were proficient in languages, in diplomacy, in literature, and yet, Daniel, Ananiah, Michelle, Azariah was, were, were how much better? Ten times better. Ten times better than anyone else. Today I'd like to make two appeals. First, to our young friends. The youth instructors, dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Have courage to do the right. A cowardly and silent reserve before evil associates while you listen to their device makes you one of them. Come out from among them and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Dare to be different by being true to God. Put aside all those things that you know you shouldn't be doing, those things that you know are defiling your conscience, those things that are breaking the law of God, the things that are destroying your character. Put them away. Whether it, it has to do with the Sabbath, stimulant, diet, relationship, whatever it may be, Put it away. And you can do it. All you have to do is like Daniel. Purpose it in your heart. And God will give you the strength to do even what is hardest for his honor. Honor God and let him honor you. The second appeal I'd like to make today has to do with what I said last time we were together. Remember when I said that Daniel 1 has the key to understand the prophecies of Daniel? Who wrote the book of Daniel? Daniel. Who got the prophecies of Daniel? Who, who receives the visions and, and the dreams? Daniel. Wasn't Daniel given all understanding of dreams and of visions? then wouldn't it just make sense that if we want to understand what Daniel wrote, we would also need to have such understanding of vision and dreams as Daniel has? That would simply make sense, right? Well, remember, what Daniel got was an effect. Cause to effect. There was a cause for him to receive such gift. And you and I, can have such gift, but of course, that will demand a certain sacrifice. We will need to be true to God, and yes, that includes diet, because a befogged mind cannot understand Scripture, let alone prophecy, but a clear mind, because we've put away everything that God said put away, will we'll give God permission to bless us with understanding so that we can understand the book of Daniel. And so my appeal today is for you and I to do the necessary changes in order that our study of the book of Daniel 
be not only profitable, but life-changing. We can live like Daniel and his friends, starting today, starting right now, starting by making the changes necessary. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the book of Daniel. I want to thank you for Daniel, who has given us an example of what we can be. An example of how we can make changes. And Father, you will bless abundantly. And I pray that as we make commitment at this time to change, that you will honor these commitments by bestowing upon us the power to carry them through. Each and every one of us know what needs to change, Father. And you know that too. So, Father, convict us of these changes. Empower us to make it. And, Father, help us to live faithfully, that as we continue to live for you, you continue to open truth and understanding to us. That, Lord, we may not only be like Daniel, but be like Jesus as well. I thank you, and I pray this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Amen.